thank you for tuning in to another episode of the hashtag black professional project today i am here with my friend my indiana family the marcus tucker Thank you for joining me, man. I really appreciate it. Um, if you guys don't know, my name is Kenton Hipshire, and this is the Black Professionals Project, where our goal is to educate and inspire black and brown youth by exposing them to careers through black and brown professionals. Um, and this is something that's really important to me because you need to be seen in society to really have an impact on the youth. So that's what we're trying to do here today. Um, so with Marcus, He's gonna share a little bit about his career, you know, his upbringing, and then hopefully shine some light for y'all and inspire some people to, you know, overcome the hurdles in their life and really take on something a little bit more challenging, such as your fourth grade math class or whatever you're doing at this time. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. So Marcus, will you first tell them, uh, you know, how, how old you are, you know, what your age group is, and uh, what your profession is. Uh, sure. Um, first, I'll start off by saying thank you for having me on, my brother. You know, of course, appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, so I'm I'm 28, and uh, my profession right now specifically uh, is being, is a manufacturing engineer, working for a company that assembles uh, locks. So you look on your door, and you see. The doorknob, you see the deadbolt, you know, to lock your door. Like we make those and just like all different kinds of door security systems. Mechanically, we also do electronically. Um, we kind of dabble in a little bit of everything, but my plan specifically does door security. Okay, awesome. That's great. Um, so the first thing that I want to ask you a little bit about is can you tell them ex what exactly manufacturing engineering is? Because, you know, a lot of different companies call manufacturing engineering uh, a lot of different roles. So how does that work necessarily for you and your company? Well, so in my company, being a manufacturing engineer, you're really going to be working, like I'd say, 70 percent on the factory floor with operators, with leads and with supervisors doing projects with them. Um, a lot of what I do, I deal with them directly. Um, so a lot of it is fixture design and also like line configuration it's all about improving 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 sorry efficiency you know that's kind of the name of the game as far as what i do um but also i do i I'll work with my documentation so work instructions for the operators which helps me to understand their processes more to be able to help them and be able to make improvements and work alongside them in those aspects so that's kind of what my day consists of. It could be, it can be anywhere from sitting at my desk for a majority of the day, um, working in 3D modeling, making fixtures for the line and for operators. Um, I could be ordering things like parts, uh, different tools that they may need out on the floor. And then also if I was at my desk, I'd be doing something like writing up standard work. So work instructions for operators um, and then also sometimes, you know, I do a little data crunching, you know, I'll, I'll look at numbers, average totals, just to kind of get a feel for, uh, you know, the past year or two, like what we've had, um, what we produced the most or the least, just depending on what the project is. And that's how we kind of prioritize as well, what we need to get done sooner rather than later. Um, and then as far as going out on the floor, a lot of it is communication. Like it, it, it is really, you, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm a people person necessarily. I'm, I'm introverted, but at the same time, I like, I like communicating with people and, you know, especially when it comes to helping people and helping improve processes and things like that. So it's good to be able to work with operators and be hands on, on the floor. So if you, you know, if you consider yourself a hands-on person, like manufacturing engineering, um, for the most part, will definitely be the role for you, honestly, in any industry that you would look at, you know. So you'd be, you'd be spending a lot of time on the factory floor if you're a manufacturing engineer. Oh, that sounds great. I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of people who want to work with their hands, this probably sounds like a good opportunity for them. And people who really just like to, you know, 
be actively involved in something, you know, not be indirectly working on something, but be directly in the game, you know, making sure things are going smoothly. So it's a cool, uh, it's a cool profession. And I feel like you gave a clear description of it. So hopefully kids, kids here will be able to understand, you know, where, where the different levels of engineering fall when we talk, uh, talk more about it in the other episodes. Now that we have a better idea of, you know, who exactly you are and what you do as a professional, uh, can you tell everybody, you know, how you would describe your ethnicity and then sort of a little bit about where you're from and where you currently live now? Yeah, so I, I would call myself a Black American, um, you know, and I, as far as the term African American, um, I personally don't define myself as that just because of our country's history, you know, stripping us, stripping us, my ancestors of our heritage. And what we have, you know, my last name is Tucker. It's not, that's, that's English. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's from Britain. <laughs> so I, I know, I know where I come from as far as that goes. Um, and, you know, I, I have no shame in that, no shame in that whatsoever. So I, I'm proud to call myself a black American. Um, and, you know, if you prefer, if you prefer the term African-American, if that's what you prefer, that's fine. It's just, I think it's preference at this point. It's not something that should be set in stone. I think it's something that should be open. Um, as far as where I come from, you know this as well as I do, Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> hey, you know, three, Nap Town. 317, Nap Town, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah, so, and like, as far as my background, as far as Indianapolis, um, I spent, I was born and raised there. So I have, that's, I just have a connection with that area, no matter what, no matter what they do, I always have a connection that out there. Um, but as far as where I'm at now, I'm in Colorado Springs, Colorado, close to the mountains. You know, I had to get away from all that flat land. You know, what I'm, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. No land, no elevation, no water. It's... Right, no water. You got to drive up to Chicago and go to that dusty <laughs> Michigan beach and all that. It's gross. It's gross. I, I was just telling. Water. <laughs> I was just telling somebody that today. I was like, man, y'all over here claiming y'all gigantic lake talking about oh it's better than the ocean no that's dirty yeah, no. that's dirty water dirty, Not come over here with that. <laughs> it's so grimy <laughs> i've seen lake michigan i have seen lake michigan it is dirty it's dirty it's dusty i don't know why people be on the beach there I, mm. mm-mm. Nah, i'll take the mountains out here in colorado i like to go i like to walk the trails and stuff anyway you know that's, that's kind of what i do that's yeah. what i do for my spare time i guess you could say Okay, cool, cool. Um, so, you know, taking that journey from the Midwest out to the to the mountains, I should say, you know, still still the West Coast, but not really the coast. It's definitely yeah. the mountain region. Um, yeah, yeah. How you know? How has that move been for your career? You know, do you feel like there's been more opportunities or an equal amount of opportunities um, now that you've moved out to Colorado? Honestly, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised by the amount of opportunities are here just in Colorado Springs. So kind of for reference, Denver, the main city, you know, the capital city, the big city out here in Colorado, it's only about an hour north of where I'm at okay. on I-25. So it's not that far of a drive, but um, I don't go to Denver often. But the amount of job opportunities that are out here in Colorado Springs, and it's comparable to Indianapolis, surprisingly. Mm. In Colorado Springs, is half the size of Indianapolis. Like I, I don't, I don't know specifically how many people we have in Indy now, but it's it's quite a bit. It's gotten a lot bigger than like, what it used to be. In the metro, I think it's like two million, isn't it? Like if you Close. include the, everything, it's like two million. It's a good size city now. Colorado Springs is growing as well. We got Amazon coming out here. Like they're building a big facility uh, a little bit outside of town, outside of the city. Um, but Colorado Springs, it's got over half a mil. It's like six to seven hundred thousand people when you include like some of the suburb er- suburban areas um but it's it's growing and it's a it's a nice little spot it's pleasant and it's been a good transition for me um as far as that goes like the transition has been pretty much seamless you know and i mean i don't i don't really take too much stock in 
those kind of things either. So I, it makes it a little bit easier to transition, kind of. And then, so I, I but yeah, it's been, it's been good. It's been good. Colorado's treated me well. <laughs> I mean, it's got what? It's uh, mountains and good beer. So <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't drink, but yeah, it's got the mountains. It's got, hey, there's good food out here, man. They got some good food. They got the good food? They got good food out here, man. And like comparable, somewhat comparable to Indianapolis. Like if you ever come out here and visit, man, whenever you do, I'll take you to Denver Biscuit Company. Tell you, change your breakfast life. What? Yes. Yes. All right, I'm gonna have to look into that, man, because I don't know. I've had some good breakfast in my life. Like breakfast is my favorite meal of the day. So I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, but I'm telling you, this place right here, it's fire. It's it's worth it. It's worth it. Just to fly out and visit, bro. (laughs) Hey, I might have to make that trip for the biscuit, though. (laughs) I might have to risk the Rona for the biscuit. Let's see what happens, though. Yeah. But um. So you gotten out here to Colorado, you know, you're living your good life uh, up in the mountains as the mountain man. And so before getting to this point in your career, you know, let's take a step back. What kind of education did you have to prepare yourself for for being a manufacturing engineer? Because, you know, in my mind, when, when I think about like, oh, I'm an engineer, I think like, uh, you've been like, you had like eight years of additional college and things like this to figure that out. So. So what really was your like academic track? Um, okay, uh, so you want me to start from high school or just um, speaking? I mean, you can start from high school. Yeah, that's a good place to, to get it going. Okay. So, I mean, uh, as far as high school goes <laughs> and preparing me for the rigors of what uh, of college, it, it did well as far as teaching me like hard work. Um, the discipline aspect of it, it took me college to kind of learn that but I'll get into that a little bit later um but as far as high school goes I didn't take like a lot of AP courses but I took honors courses so like with my math and my science I took honors physics I took honors um like pre-calc and trigonometry were taught and they were taught as one class and it was mm-hmm. an honors course so I didn't take AP calc things like that I didn't have programming classes like some of these other kids I went to a small Catholic high school that was in the hood. So their funding was on this high. Cardinal Ritter, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm. Mean, it's, it's tough to shout them out nowadays. You know, they they have, but it, it that school uh, at that school, I learned. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Um, I had great teachers. I had some really good teachers there that were able to help prepare me along the way, um, and they were very helpful to me. But um, so I, once I was done with Ritter. I went to Rose Holman, you know, uh, <laughs> shout out to alma mater. And to be honest, I was not looking at Rose Holman. <laughs> you know, you and I talked about this earlier. <laughs> like I yep. applied there as, you know, just as a favor for my mom, you know, and my guidance counselor, my senior Dang. guidance counselor. She, <laughs> uh, she told me that I should get into engineering because of my aptitude for uh, math and science. So, but the thing about Rose is that excuse me I was fortunate enough to play football there for four years as well so kind of getting recruited by them in high school it helped me kind of see okay maybe you know if the coach is calling because he only called in certain individuals from my high school football team those that had the GPA and the coursework that actually like made sense Mm -hmm. but he was first off he's a master recruiter I've never seen a division three coach recruit like coach Earhart did like that man was elite but he you know, the way he explained it to us, like, you can come out making 60 grand a year once you graduate from Rose Holman. And so I took those words to heart. And I was just like, all right, all right, now I'll apply. I actually applied there on the last day that you could send in application. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. No cap. Last day. The last day I got my application in and um, I got accepted. <laughs> then was able to go. And my first three years at Rose were... It was bad academically. I had a lot of fun, you know, I had a lot of fun playing football and stuff like that. But I was, I'm gonna be honest and frank, I was lazy. Um, you know, high school came easy to me. Even even the tough courses, I may have to ask a teacher here and there, you know, to get a, a tough homework problem, help with that. But as far as just being able to just grind through it, high school was easy. 
my parents were pushing me. I had great a great support system as far as my parents goes. They they pushed me very hard as far as school. That's what they stressed. You know, that was what they stressed over sports and things like that. You know, my religious beliefs in school. So it was one of those things where once I got to college, I got that free reign, and you know, I, I let myself go a little bit more wild than I should have. You know, a little a little bit extra but you know after i made it through the that, those bumpy three years and what really got me through was at the end of my junior year i was on academic probation but i just found out um like about a week or two into the summer that i had gotten the internship that i had been interviewed for so junior year going into senior year you know my cumulative gpa was like a two one bro i was down bad but but I got that internship um, and I was able to work with, in a roller and ball bearing plant. So that was manu- that was my first taste of manufacturing. And what it showed me was all this theoretical stuff. Like, I'm not good with theory. Theory, uh, it doesn't bore me, but at the same time, just at the mental state that I was, you know, and what I was fighting through mentally, you know, like, because I, I, I could honestly say those first three years, I was doing so bad that I honestly was depressed. And it was my own fault, but it, like my my version of depression is, you know, you shut yourself out. You, you you do things you do things that like I do things that just don't even make sense sometimes, like in my own mind. So once I got past that, got in my internship, I was able to see what all the theory and all those things that the professors were trying to show me uh, in those first three years. I could see put into action. I could see critical thinking put into action, problem solving put into action and you know put into real world applications and that's what I that's when I realized like okay this is what this is my wheelhouse you know I'm I'm not going to be a computer programmer I'm not going to be you know I may not be a, an electrical engineer or anything like that but my major was in mechanical engineering so I got to dabble in a little bit of everything and that's what I liked about it it's just being able to dabble um being a master you know a jack of all trades master of none I guess you could say <laughs> um but that internship really showed me the real world application to things. And so my senior year and, you know, I had to go back there for a fifth year, not a full year, but two quarters and finish out. And I had internships both those summers, same company. Um, and they brought me back on at a higher rate the next year because I, you know, I had proven myself. I've done well. I did well that first year. And some of the suggestions, especially like floor planning, because I worked in the maintenance area as an intern. So realistically, I was just there to help efficiency any way that I could, you know, whether it was layout, relaying out things, um, you know, as far as material or dies for certain machinery, things like that, um, just making it more efficient, making the department run smoother. And when I came back my next year, uh, that next summer, I was in um, safety that time. And like the only thing that kind of got me through that honestly was seeing that the suggestions that I made beforehand that summer before some of them have been implemented like especially floor plan wise like rearranging of certain material and where it's placed at things like that yeah I was able to see that firsthand I saw that they used some of my floor plans and you know that that helps me really understand like oh I'm actually good at this like it actually makes sense I you know, this is something I'm good at. But safety? Nah, bro. Safety ain't it. It's not for me. <laughs> safety and manufacturing, man, you are the bane of existence. Man, I Listen, I went to those, I went to my first summer intern in there. I was cool with everybody. Mm-hmm. Came back the next summer, people was asking me like, oh, okay. So what are you doing this, this time around? They didn't necessarily like the guy who was running safety at the time. So, <laughs> so I told him, I was like, yeah, I'm working with so-and-so doing safety. And they were just like, ah, oh, hey, you work with him. <laughs> they were still cool with me, but it was just like, <laughs> it's like, man, I'm sorry you got to work with him, man. I was like, man, I'm taking it one day at a time. I learned a lot of documentation, though, doing safety. I had to update lockout, tagout procedures. So I learned a lot about locking, lockout, tagout um, with machines on the manufacturing floor. You know, so where to lock out, tag out. So <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? Uh, can you explain that for you know, the younger crowd who may not have that experience, you know, what what are some of those terms mean, like lockout or tagout? So lockout, tagout is just like a procedural thing. And depending on the machine, you could, it's cutting off the power sources to that machine. So okay. machines will have 
um, electrical power, pneumatic power, which is air, sometimes water, you know, a water line going to it. And you have to find those points, usually some type of valve through the line. You got to shut off those points. And with electrical, it's usually uh, what we would call e-stop, which stands for an electrical stop, which is just literally like a big red button that cuts off all the electrical power to the machine. Like that's literally what it does. But for water and airlines, you gotta find where those valves are that actually cut it off going to that machine that you want to work on. And that's what it's about. It's it's a safety procedure so that you can shut down the machine safely. It's kind of like when you shut down a game system or a computer, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Yeah. So that's the right way to do it. Lockout, tagout. You don't want to work on machines while they're still, especially like live electrical power and pneumatic power. Um, presses can be activated. Like there's, there's other measures, safety measures, especially at the plant that I work at now that they try to take to make sure those things don't happen. But your best and safest bet is to lock out and uh, make sure everything is secure and all the lines um, are stopped as far as what is sending to that machine. I see. Okay. That's a good explanation. And I feel like that'll help orient people a little bit more because, uh, you know, for some of, some of the terms we get in engineering, we get so accustomed to, we just forget that, you know, like people just right. don't, they just don't understand even the simple things like, e-stop right like that sounds like electrical stop but to the <laughs> average person you may not think that so it's right. good to just provide that clarity um so you know you mentioned you had some some struggles you know in in your schooling and stuff and that it was hard and i, I share that same story i know for for rose for me because uh, i also went to rose holman um but i'm not an engineer it's completely different but um <laughs> <laughs> but I also went there and I had the same story. Like I, you know, my first year, really first like year and a half, I just was lazy. Like I really, I, high school came easy to me. So when I came to college and at a school like that, where you really are challenged, um, there's no excuse to not working hard. You have to work hard to succeed. And what ultimately I learned at that school and what I feel like many of you, if you learn early, even in high school, you'll be way ahead of the pack, is how to learn. Learn how to learn. How you learn, more importantly, is the key. Because everybody learns differently. Some people will learn better from hearing, some people will learn better from seeing, some people will learn better from writing, you know, but you need to figure out what works for you. And at a school like Rose, they don't even give you that option. <laughs> just like, they're like, yo, right. we got all these problems and you gonna answer them one way or another. <laughs> I don't care how you get to the answer, but you gonna answer them and they better be right because there ain't no like 90s a B. Like it's <laughs> 90, 90 is, is not even close to where you should be. If you're not hitting a 95, you're not, you're not even close to the A range. So, so get, get your mind away from that. But I digress. The important part here is learn how you learn and make sure you're taking the steps to figure that out early. That'll put you way ahead of the pack. Um, right. And so, the, yeah, could I piggyback off that for a second too? Yeah, go Just, for it. Because like learning how you learn, like you said, is so important. For me personally, uh, I'm a writer. I'm repetition. Like you give me a problem, I may not understand it, but I'll figure out how to understand it. And then also like in class, like my first three years, I was not a good note taker because in high school, I didn't have to be like, honestly, I just didn't have to be. But Rose, like, and to their credit, honestly, as difficult and as challenging as that school is, they give you all the resources. They give you all the help, all the help that you need, you can find on that campus. You ain't even got to go off campus. Like, yes. And fraternities, they have their own files and stuff like that. They have their own files in uh, in our specific departments, I think, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. They had old test files, old homework files in our own departments that you could go find. Like, they want you to succeed, but you're going to work for it. And you're going to figure out, you're going to sink or you're going to swim. But the thing is, they're going to help you swim if you look for it. And those first three years, I wasn't looking for that help. That's why I was sinking. <laughs> and then I figured out, I learned how to swim in that environment, man. And, you know, and another thing for us is like, as, as black people, you know, going to a school like that, it's, 
it's not I can't say that it's not diverse because there's there's people of different cultures there. Like I had friends of all different types of cultures. I had friends that were from that were Indian. I had friends that were Asian. I had you know friends that were white, friends that were black. You know, and it's just like there's. But being there and being black, you'll under you you will stand out. And for me, it wasn't that wasn't necessarily the biggest issue because going to Catholic schools, you know, I was usually one of the few black people in the school until I got to high school. But, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's a mental thing. It's a mental thing. And you just really have to, the main thing is figuring out how you learn. You know, if you, if you have to do a problem two, three times, just to really understand it, like sometimes I had to, um, then that, that's okay. They'll work with you. And, you know, as far as test taking goes, high school doesn't, for, for kids like us that have, that are quick to understand things, high school won't show you how bad of a test taker you are. Rose, though, however, will show you how bad of a test taker. Like, I realize that I'm not a good test taker for Rose Holman standards. So I got to come in prepared. There's no such thing as cramming at a school like that for me. I know some people that crammed, but honestly, they were a part of that one percent. Those are the kids that just got it off off top. So, yeah, like really studying and understand and learning how to study. You know, learning how to learn and learning how to study. So for me, practice problems. Like I'm I'm going back through my homework problem. I'm figuring. I'm looking at other homework problems. I'm going through old tests. I'm telling you, I went through so many old tests those last two years at Rose. <laughs> just redoing them just so I can understand. I'd see problems on the test that I'm taking like, oh yeah, I saw that on that 2005 version <laughs> of this test. Yeah, I saw that. Because I have a decent enough memory to where if I, you know, if I grind hard enough, I'm going to remember some of the things, a lot of the things that I did and retain it over mm -hmm. that 10-week period that we have as far as our quarters are concerned. So, yeah. yeah, to your point, man, figuring out how you learn, figuring out how you What's the best way for you to study? You know, you, you may not be able to do it with your friends. Like you may not be able to do it in a group. You may have to be by yourself. For me, it was listening to music. I listened to instrumentals, doing homework and studying. Like I, I couldn't do words, so I couldn't listen to my favorite songs or anything like that. But I, I fell in love with instrumentals in college because that's how, that's what helped me learn. Because I needed music to focus, but I just needed that that beat, that steady beat, rocking. Yeah, I, I feel you on that and. You know, um, there's a lot of lessons really that we've learned from going through such a rigorous process. Um, and they've helped us overcome some of the obstacles that we have to face in the workforce today. Uh, you know, I would say that going to, and not that we're saying like, you need to go to a crazy hard college because that's the only way you're gonna right. be successful. That's not what we're saying at all. Mm -hmm. What we're just saying is from our experience being at a crazy hard college, um, you know, it's put us in a position where we know how to learn and we learn, we know how to study. And on top of that, as being student athletes, we've also learned how to manage our time. So the day to day work life that we have in our professional careers is much easier than it was in school. It's 10, it's almost 10 times easier for me to manage my time now than it was then um, for a variety of reasons. But uh, you know, talking about those obstacles that we've overcome, what are two obstacles that you have to face today in the workforce um, in your career? Um, honestly, the main, I would say the main obstacle for me is just, you know, knowing that as a minority person, specifically a black man, going into work, you got to prove yourself at a different level, a different way than you know you know your white contemporaries so it's 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 that mental struggle that you have with yourself because and I, and I can give you you know I can share a quick story so when I got hired on at the place that I'm currently working now uh, we have these meetings where we talk about the private like everybody's in there my boss is in there uh, the plant manager who's over like all the operations of the plant he's in there and you know a bunch of other higher ups and specific departments are there as well as people at my level in their other departments are there and so in one of those meetings I think this happened it happened last year I had had lunch a little bit like this is this is like a Thursday 1 p.m meeting like so 
I had lunch maybe a little bit too close to that meeting time. And if you don't have a project that's specifically on the board or, or whatever, you know, like as far as what they're focusing on, you don't really have to talk in that meeting. So you really just have to listen. So I was kind of like nodding off, you know, a little bit. So the plant manager saw it, you know, and caught the itis. Caught the eye of some higher ups that I really don't want to catch the eye of unless it's something positive. But uh, so, you know, my boss pulls me in, probably starts talking to me about it. And he told he tells me that, you know, the plant manager, he, he saw you uh, nodding off, you know, and, he, you know, and, he, and I was like, I understood, you know, I was in the wrong. Mm-hmm. I was in the wrong. I was in the wrong. But the thing is, is like, you know, my boss came out and said, oh, you know, it could affect your performance. You know, it could affect your performance review at the end of the year. And I'm like, dog, for one meeting? You know, and, and the thing is, here's, here's, here's the thing. I've seen people fall asleep in that meeting. I've seen my boss fall asleep in that meeting. I guarantee you it ain't affecting his end of the year performance thing. And then there's another situation. There's another thing that we do or that we used to do. Like at the, we would have these boards where we kind of talk about issues in the plant like every morning. Yeah. And so... For myself, until they get to my department, sometimes I, you know, I may, I may uh, drift a little bit, you know, mentally. I may check out a little bit, but I guess I was a little bit. It was too obvious or something. I don't know. It, it just things like that. That as a black professional working in a white man's world, you're gonna have to, you're, you're gonna have to always one prove yourself. And you're always gonna have to be cautious in some way, you know, to some level, I, you know, and it don't matter, it don't matter where you were, you should really honestly always want to, you know, prove yourself and, you know, expect higher, you know, better for yourself and all those things. But at the same time, being black and working in a world, you know, in the engineering field, you're going to deal with those people that don't look like you, majority speaking. And so that can be, you know, a little bit a little bit, you know, of a, a just a tough situation, especially for black kids who grow up in predominantly black neighborhoods and schools. You know, I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood. But, you know, my schooling was able to help me kind of deal with people of uh, different races and ethnicities, mainly white people. Um, but at the same time, just knowing in the workforce, if you're going to get into a career like this, that's something that you got to keep in the back of your mind, you know, and it should it be that way? No, but it's the reality of the world we still live in today. Um, and then it's just things like that that you have to keep in the back of your mind. You know, mm-hmm. don't let it discourage you, but you have to keep it in the back of your mind because people are always watching you. You know, it's true. you're different than them. So they're always going to be watching you. And they want to, and some people are going to be watching to see if you mess up. Like, no matter what, no matter how much good you do for your company. Some people are going to, you know, just look and just wait to see if you can mess up. And another thing is, is like the second thing I would say is when I was younger, um, when I had my first job coming out of Rose, I was a supervisor. So at 23 years old, I'm supervising people of all different ages, like 11. And it was an 11 man crew. And I worked for um a tomato cannery, red gold tomatoes. You know, you, you know, yeah, I've been you know there many about. times. <laughs> yeah, good old Arrestus, Indiana. Arrest, arrest us, God, man. I'm telling. I'll tell you what. Uh, like being that young and being a supervisor was very eye opening to me. Um, your emotions can get the best of you in certain situations, especially when you're younger. As you get older, you kind of learn to balance it out. You learn, you learn to really, really not take things so seriously to be able to just wait and process things and then give your response. So, you know, I've had, I had situ, I had one situation specifically where I had messed up as a supervisor. I had made a call on something and I was wrong. I was in the wrong. And so I had a guy who kind of technically worked under me as a lead. Uh, we called it a utility in that, um, in that plant specifically but he you know he called me out on it and I took offense to it and I took and it was a very unprofessional moment for me you know I was, I'm gonna be honest I was ready to fight this 60 something year old white dude for calling me out like any and, and you know there was nothing 
There was nothing racial about what he said. It was nothing like that. He's just mm-hmm. that he he's a very straightforward person. And I respected him for that because he also knew what he was doing. He was very good at his job. So he helped me out a lot. He helped me grow in that role a lot. So I respected his opinion. But that time, I just, I don't know. I guess I didn't like how he said it to me. And <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it was, it was awkward. I had, because we were in the quality lab, we were looking at some product that was kind of like, all right, what do we do to it? Do we add this? Do we take away this? And I made the wrong call. And uh, he, he was telling me we should have did this. And I I went against him for like probably the first time since I had been working there, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And he didn't, he didn't like it. I took offense to the way he told me. And I ended up apologizing to him. I apologized to the people in the lab, you know, because I, I, I was very out of character in that specific moment and situation like I went back to the neighborhood can't do that you can't even like kids do not listen don't get it twisted we are black professionals we are black we are proud to be black but man I'm gonna tell you right now there are certain things you got to leave in your neighborhood you cannot like when you have a dispute you can't just fight you can't just square up with somebody <laughs> you yeah, know on no. the factory floor so I mean it was it was it was a real, uh, it was a learning moment for me. I had to do a lot of apologizing for uh, the way I conducted myself. And I understood that, that I was in the wrong. So those are, those are the two things that are kind of like stick out in my mind as far as being a black professional and what you may have to deal with the struggles and just being ready for those, being ready for those mentally, the best way that you can. and. Uh, when those come up, just handling it again the best way that you can. Yeah, I think, you know, to su- sort of summarize uh, what you said, you know, the first thing really just being aware of who you are and where you are in your situation. Um, and the second thing, you know, taking responsibility for, you know, mistakes that you make or the or just the actions that you take, even if they're not a, res- not a mistake, you know, if you do something well, you know, you need to be proud of that take responsibility for that um just conduct yourself in a professional manner and you know to echo what you said it's really it's really something that is not native native to you know what your upbringing is going to be it's going to be something that you're going to have to adjust to you're going to have to learn to do this but if you can you know practice try to bring your best self to work every day and in every situation, you you will be able to do these things. Um, but really, you know, it's all going to come down to the amount of effort that you put in. And I think that's something that's been uh, the underlying uh, foundation for the, for your story. Really, you know, it's just you know, it's really about the effort that you put into specific situations in your life that have got you to the success level that you're at now. So. Um, you know, with that, I think it's good that we focus on overcoming the obstacles, but also discuss the benefits. You know, what are, what are some of the things that get you excited about your daily job, that get you out of bed to go, you know, manufacture whatever it is that you're working on that day? Um, so, yeah, if you could just elaborate, you know, on a couple points as far as the pros of being a manufacturing engineer, what would that be? As far as um, being a manufacturing engineer for me, um, I like I like challenges. You know, Rose really groomed it grooms us to be able to handle challenges, to be able to problem solve whatever major in engineering or math and science that you get. It, it's really about problem solving. Um, so for me, like I I actually enjoy waking up and knowing that oh okay, I know I've got this fixture that fixture this problem out on the floor that we didn't solve yesterday, but you know, we probably will get back at it tomorrow. So like, I there's a very few days that I go home discouraged because I, I personally don't like to take my work home with me anyway, mm-hmm. but I don't, I don't go home discouraged if I didn't fix the problem that day, because I know I wake up to it and it'll be there tomorrow, you know, and I'm ready to go get it. So I, I like challenges. Like those, those are the things that, keep me going like I, I hate days where I don't have much you know much to do and I'm just talking with other co-workers and stuff while I'm looking for you know it's fun you know and there'll be days like that but and that's all fun and well but I like 
I go to work. I go to work to put in work. You know, I that's that's what I that's honestly what I live for as far as my career and my profession goes in the manufacturing world. So that, those challenges out on the floor, those are the thing. That's the thing that keeps me, you know, going to work every day. It keeps me enthusiastic about what I do. Gotcha. That's great. I mean, you know, it's always nice to be challenged and to have the opportunity to, you know, use your hands to make something better for somebody, you know, to help improve somebody's life um, and, you know, have an opportunity to do that, whether if it's directly or indirectly, um, you know, in, in your terms, more directly because you're working with security. Um, but for some people, it may be indirect, but still you have that opportunity. So you have to see it as an opportunity and really take it for what it is. Uh, so just to close here, I just want to ask you, you know, two last questions. So you've already told us a little bit about what's a day in life for you, you know, some of the obstacles that you've had and really how you got started doing what you're doing. But what's one misconception that people have about um, being a manufacturing engineer or, you know, if that's not specific enough, you are too specific. You could say like engineering in general. Uh, I would say that one, that one was kind of a that one was kind of a difficult one to uh, answer. But I'll say the mis like as far as manufacturing engineering goes, people will either know what you do or you'll have to spend a few minutes kind of explaining what you have to do. So it's not really a misconception. It's just kind of a understanding thing. But as far as a misconception with engineering, you know, just thinking that it's all numbers and theory and things like that. And it's like, no, there's there's so many different things that you can do with engineering. I mean, I I was able at my uh, second job, so my job between Red Gold and here, I was at a place called Interdale and they produced lithium ion batteries, manufactured those. So I would travel. I was a service engineer and I would travel to customer sites. So I got a chance to, you know, travel the country and even go up to Canada. You know, I went out to Hawaii um, and just a few other places in the um, in the lower 48 states. So that that's kind of a misconception is that engineers are like the nerdy calculator, pencil pushing, number crunching people. And it's like, oh, yeah, we crunch numbers, but every whatever your role is you, you're crunching it a different way you, you, you're doing it's, it's a lot of variety to it you know it's a lot of variety a lot of very uh variation a lot of different ways you can do it you know i look at yourself as well you know you're like not even an engineer now you know <laughs> you're in sales so it's like yeah engineering can take you to sales. I, I got a few other friends that are in sales that are in consulting i mean it's it's a lot of this thing this this major can take you a lot of different places as long as you let it, as long as you put in the work. Definitely. I think, you know, just to replace the word engineering with problem solving, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Like yeah, there's, there's no absolutely. difference. You just have a specific set of problems that you're solving for. That's really the only difference. That's what makes chemical engineers different from mechanical engineers and mechanical engineers different from civil engineers. If they just have a specific set of problems they're working with. That's really all. So, you know, if you can figure, like find the problem, um, you know, break it down and try to reverse engineer a solution or come up with a new solution, you're doing engineering. And you do that every day in your daily life. You may not even think about it. You know, if, if you're, you know, if you have like a, I don't know, if you have like a, a PS4 or something and your controller breaks, if you're trying to figure out a way to, you know, put your controller back together, you're doing engineering. Like you're, you're trying to solve a problem. So right. it's really more practical than people think it is. People, like you said, people get caught up in the numbers and all this stuff, but it's just problem solving at its core. And if you can keep that in your mind, it'll make it a lot easier for you to process what's going on. Um, so to close here, what are a couple of things you want to leave everybody with as far as advice on how to get into um, becoming a manufacturing engineer. Like I know at Rose you were mechanical, so you know that's mm -hmm. that's the more direct path. But um, outside of going and getting your mechanical engineering degree, do you have any other advice for people who are interested in becoming a manufacturing engineer? 
Uh, yeah, I would I would honestly say as far as and and not only just to speak to manufacturing engineering, but to your career in general. Um, realistically, you have to, you know, don't be afraid to move. Don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid of the unknown. You know, I I went and so as far as like going from college to into the workforce, just understand what's to be expected of you. Like in that job, in that role, if you understand what's to be expected of you, then that leaves it up to your discretion how you handle that. So always keep that in mind. Understand what's expected of you. Don't let someone who's trying to hire you, you know, just not deceive, but like understand the job that you're applying for. Ask those questions in the interviews. Look at the job description very thoroughly and have questions for your interviewer when you interview with them. Because not only does it show that you're putting in the effort as the person being interviewed, but it also shows that you're trying to learn before you even get into the position. Like that, that showing that you're willing to learn and showing that you're able to comprehend and understand, especially your role, that those are two big things. And then once you get into this career, again, don't be afraid to move. Like, and even if it's a lateral move, seriously, like I think a lot of people are afraid to make job changes because it's like, oh, it's a lateral move or, or, or something like this or that. And I'm just like, as far as my job here in Colorado, I'm not making, I'm not making, well, I am now, but when I first got this job, I wasn't making that much more than what I was getting paid at Interdale back home in Indianapolis. So, and it was, you know, cheaper to live out in Indianapolis. I had roommates. I had to stay with my parents for a little bit. So I could, you know, I could have stayed at that job. I could have still been there at that job. But when this opportunity came up to get into manufacturing, I jumped at it. You know, I wasn't afraid of, oh, what about relocation? Uh, I don't have family out here. I don't have friends out here. I don't know anybody out here. And, you know, me being, you know, a little bit more introverted, that, that can be a real concern for people who have a personality like I do. But it wasn't for me. I didn't let that concern me because at the end of the day, you, you got to make that, you got to do what's best for you. You know, you. I'd honestly rather see kids coming up in the professional world be happy. You know, don't be complacent. If you if you feel you're getting complacent and you're just like kind of you know you're just there, then it's probably time to start looking, man. Brush up on your brush up your resume. Get on LinkedIn. Start looking for some jobs. You know, because that means that that company that role isn't challenging you anymore, and that's okay. That just means you outgrew that role. And if they're not willing to, you know, either, you know, bump, like bump your position up, like give you more responsibility, because it's not even about the money at that point. Like if you if you're a professional, this is what you live for, whatever it is. So this is part of your livelihood. And mm -hmm. so don't don't take that for granted. Treat it like your livelihood. Treat it like, you know, like you would treat something is a quality of life you know quality of living like you want to move somewhere else treat jobs like that treat your career like that that's great i think those are great pieces of advice um if you think about it you know your career really is a major part of your life you spend eight hours a day out of you know a third of your day is at work so if you're not happy with that third of your day the other third is sleeping then you're only living for one third of your life so if you if you live to be you know 100 you're only li actually living 33 years so you really want to make sure you know you're getting the most happiness and joy from the career that you work in and like you mentioned that's that may not be your first job it, it may be may not be your second job but eventually if you're if that's still a goal in your mind you will get there so uh, with that, I want to thank Marcus for coming on. I appreciate you again, my Indiana brother, and my Rose yes, Holder family. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, and with that, that has been another episode of the hashtag Black Professionals Project. Make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe. Um, down in the link, uh, down in the description below, you'll see links to the rest of our social media. Please make sure you follow us. 
And if you guys have any comments or questions or suggestions on who I should talk to next, you know, specific careers, it doesn't even have to be specific people, then drop them down there and I'll reach out to them and, you know, try to get them on here. So this is really to build a community for you all so that we can connect the black professionals that are currently working today with the ones that will be working here in a few years. So we can join those two forces together and help build a bigger community. And with that, thank you guys for tuning in. Love you guys. I'll see y'all later.